Good evening. Let's all stand. It's good to see everyone out tonight. And let's start with that uh, chorus, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Oh 
the Lord with our prayer requests. Uh, certainly remember Brother Brian in this service. God would have his way. Also, uh, please remember Brother uh, Jim Pitts that he's uh, kind of been not feeling well. Let's remember him. It's been going on for some time that God would touch him. Also, uh, Brother Joseph Osborne uh, requested prayer. He had an anxiety attack the other day and and uh, he's uh, want us to remember him. Also, uh, Brother Peter Jager, uh, he's not feeling well, and that's why they're not here, so please remember them. Are there any other spoken requests we'll need to make known? All unspoken with an uplifted hand, I'll ask Brother Peter if you would please lead us in prayer. Lord and Father, we have so much to be thankful for, yes. Lord. So many promises that you've given us, Lord. Just a wonderful, perfect word that yes. you sent us a prophet to make sure that we were lined up for that taking away, Lord. Yes. And Father, while we're here, we're very needy, Lord. We have yes. many things that we have need of, Lord. We have brothers and sisters who are sick and afflicted, Father. And, uh, some of those that are sick, my brother Jimmy. And, yes. Uh, Many others that that are sick and you mentioned, Father, and Brother Peter Jagger and, and down with the flu and, and the anxiety attack that just followed him. Yes. Lord, your calming hand and, and influence, Lord, can change all things. Yes. Father, we have unspoken requests that we raise our hands for. So we know our hearts, Lord. We know what we need, Father, and we just come before you and request these things, knowing that. You are the great source of, of all things. So, Lord, we thank you for it. We ask you things in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You will turn to number 141, nothing but the blood. Oh! 
certainly a privilege and honor to be here tonight and realizing all of the mess the world is in as your prophet said the world is falling apart. The <coughs> Father, we know that you're not falling apart. In fact, you're coming more and more into your church and coming more and more into us, Father. And by your grace and by your mercy, Father, we're becoming more obedient sons to thee. And so, Father, we're thankful that you love us and that you first loved us. And as we learn how to love you, Father, in return, may we reflect it through loving one another. And so, Lord, we come tonight for this communion service and we're studying that wonderful message. Christ is the mystery of God revealed. And there's so many wonderful things that your prophet has to say in this, Father. We just pray that we take the time and look at these things, each and every one of them, that they might help us, Lord, in understanding our own position. For we ask it humbly in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 <coughs> this evening I'd like to uh, continue with this understanding of the, uh, looking at the threefold purpose of God. Uh, as we continue to examine our grand sermon, Christ is missing by the real. And uh, <clears throat> we focus on paragraphs uh, 74 and 75 where Brother Branham honed in on, uh, on what it meant to be a Christian. And, uh, and then we, uh, Sunday, last Sunday, we looked at paragraph 76, uh, which is 140 in your books if you have them. I have two actions with some of these coming here. And uh, where Brother Brad is talking about the threefold purpose, and uh, he says, What is the threefold purpose to us? And so I believe by God's help and who's present, uh, he'll show us tonight as we begin to look at these things. But first, uh, since we focused our thoughts on the scripture, on this great mystery secret last Sunday, I thought tonight we'd begin to look more. Um, exactly and what this threefold purpose of God is all about the program is talking about. So paragraph 76 he said, now notice <coughs> you know, God had, has had a threefold purpose in his great mystery secret. God in his great mystery secret that he had before the world began. He's got a threefold purpose in it. And now what we want to go upon this morning is what is that threefold purpose? See now, I believe by the help of God who's present He'll show it to us. And so, let's begin by looking at the three, threefold purpose of what God is. And then we're going to break down the list of the three points, and uh, or the three purposes, and review each point as he makes them. But in paragraph 77, Brother Brown said, Now, if he had this threefold purpose, he want, uh, we want to find out what is this threefold purpose. The first thing was, in paragraph 78, the first thing was that God wanted to reveal himself to the people. Now, that's fact number one. Let's just lay these out as facts, okay? Because just like when we did the Godhead study, when we put down the facts that actually Brother Brian defined, God went by. He always said, I'm not a oneness. He said, Jesus can't be his own father. <coughs> he said, Jesus and God are not one of your fingers one. He said, the body is not deity, but the deity dwelt in the body. All those facts. And we're going to lay out the, the facts in order to get to the threefold purpose here. And, uh, and so Brother Brian said, the first thing that uh, was that God wanted to reveal himself to the people. So that's fact number one. God had a purpose and plan. He wanted to reveal himself. But he couldn't do it as great Jehovah God who covered all space and time and eternity. He couldn't do it. He's too great to ever be revealed to people because it would be too mysterious. So now we have a problem. All right, The problem is this, that God, God wants to reveal, but he can't. We're not capable. Now that's a problem. But not for God. He says he could not. He wants to, but he couldn't. He's too great to ever be revealed to people because it would be too mysterious. How could that great being that never did begin, that after you went beyond the cycle of hundreds of billions of trillions and trillions of years of life space, and I'm not into the infinite, it's into the eternity, and a great creature uh, that was all that and still is. So you see, Brother Ben lays out for us some facts that we must be able to understand if, if in fact, we are able to comprehend what God's threefold plan is. Now, fact number one, God wants to be known. He wants to express himself. That's fact number one. <clears throat> but there's some other facts that complicate this, this issue. Brother Ram said in paragraph 78, but what, uh, what, what he wanted to do, he loved fatherhood, for he was a father, and the only way that he could express it was to become a son of man. That's the reason Jesus kept saying the son of man. See, they didn't know what he's talking about, many of them, but now you get it. He, he wanted to express himself, that was his, 
One of his great threefold purposes was to express himself, identify himself with human beings, to reveal himself in Christ. So the first fact that we have to deal with is that God wants to be known. He wants to express himself. That fact is number one, but there are some other facts that complicate the issue. Number two, God's invisible. Therefore, in his invisible, immortal form, he is way too infinite, way too eternal, way too complicated, way too mysterious in that form to be comprehended by the mortal man. And then we have another factor, fact number three. God is too great to be comprehended by the human mind. So we really have a problem because God wants the human, <coughs> he wants to express himself to man, but man is not capable. Man doesn't have the intellect, man doesn't have the understanding, man doesn't have an ability to understand that, that, that those kind of things. And we have another problem. God can't change. Right? So if God can't change, who's going to have to change? Man. In order for man, in order for God to express himself, man had to be able to change. Now in the book of Isaiah 55 and 8, we read, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now that's fact. Therefore, it's very evident that unless the Lord does something, there is just no way for man to understand the things of God, especially the great deep hidden things. After all, they've been kept hidden via the same factors that we put forth as the two accompanying facts to God's great purpose to be expressed. Number one, he's invisible. Number two, he's so great and complex in his intrinsic nature that no mortal can understand him. So we see then that God himself, who cannot change, has made a way for us to change so that we can come to an understanding of him and his way. Now that's what this message is all about. God came down to give you his mind. You see? Because with your own mind, there's no way that you could you could see the, un, the, the unveiling of the mighty God. And Brother Ann told us in paragraph 76 that God has done just that through His Son, Jesus Christ, who revealed Him or expressed Him to us. In 1 John 5 and 20 we read, And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath, past has given us an understanding that we might know Him that is true. <coughs> so we see the first, <coughs> the first whole purpose is that God used the body of his son to express his intrinsicality and his essentiality. Those are big words by the values to toss out, but I think you all know what they mean, so I'll toss them out as well. And the Apostle tells us that our understanding comes through faith, which Brother Brown told us that faith is a revelation, something that's been revealed. And we find in Hebrews 11 and verse 3, through faith we understand. That's what it says. Through faith we understand. Now, in order to receive faith, we must first receive the one who God sends to us to bring that revelation. And Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord will give the understanding in all things. He's just saying, if you would just consider what I'm saying, the Lord will give you understanding in all things. Now, what does it mean to consider? I'm just in common... Arkansas English. What does it mean to consider? Think about it. All right, to think about it. Okay, now let's build a little bit on that because that's right. But just think and let it pass. What's God wanting to do? He's wanting to get our focus. And, and you know, like in the Old Testament, He says, if you hearken to the Lord, to the voice of the Lord our God. Well, it's thinking about and going deeper and deeper, and, and if you think, you think more and more and more, until finally he says, you love him with your heart, your mind, all your understanding, and everything else. All right. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give the understanding. So our considering and taking to heart is what makes available to us the understanding which God wants to give us, as we see in Colossians 2 and 2, where he says, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and as all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father of Christ. So we're talking about coming through this, that, that our hearts might be comforted, and our hearts being knit together in love, bringing us unto all riches of the full, of the full assurance of understanding. In fact, Paul tells us that the very purpose of his ministry in Colossians 1 and 9 was for this cause we also, since the day that we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, 
and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So Paul's whole ministry, Brother Branham's whole ministry, Brother Vale's whole ministry, <coughs> all of the brethren, their whole ministry was to make known, to help to bring understanding. You see. And we know it is God's will that we come to an understanding, as Paul tells us in Philippians 1 and 12. He said, but I would that you would understand, brethren. I would. My will, I, 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 you know, my, my purpose is for you to understand. And again in Ephesians 5, 17. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So again, there's, there's a desire to see the people understand and it comes via hearing or, or reading God's word. As we see in Ephesians 3 and verse 4, whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So Paul says, even when you're reading the text or reading the epistles that I write unto you, he said, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And notice in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, we see that by hearing the word, their understanding opened up to them. Notice, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Jesus talked to them and opened up their scriptures. That's why it's so important, you, you children, you, you adults, it's so important every day. Get that Bible out, read it, so you might understand. But notice then, it is not just hearing with our ears, but rather Jesus wants us to focus on what he is saying. Listen to his rebuke in Mark 7, verse 18. And he saith unto them, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive what that whatsoever things from without entry into a man it cannot be found? Notice, he, he say, are you, are you after telling these parables, are you still without understanding? You see, when we come to church, there ought to be things going on in our mind. You know, we're, 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 we're. You know, there ought to be, uh, there ought to be something moving us in our heart and our soul. Now, the problem of Malachi 4 was to restore our hearts, but our, is our heart really with God? Or is it just with self? Remember we've read many times from Romans chapter 8 where he says, you know, he that lives for self, he cannot, he cannot please God. <coughs> you see? In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that the very reason that the spirit of wisdom and revelation comes down in this hour is that we might come to an understanding. Ephesians 1.15 Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, notice for this purpose, that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What good would Noah's message have done if Noah didn't understand the message? God says it's going to rain, but you know, it never, never had rain. They didn't have a term for rain. I mean, it just didn't rain. Right? So, Noah could have said, well, I don't understand, therefore I'm not accountable. Mm -mm. God told him. Just like Brother Brad said uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the dream that Billy Paul had, where they were in the church late at night, and uh, Brother Brad came in and said, Paul, come on, we got to go, the Lord's coming. And some man stood up and said, uh, you know, uh, no man knows the day or the hour, but I didn't say the day or the hour, I said before the morning. And so I said, come on, Paul, we'll be late. Paul said, well, what about my wife, my, 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 my children? And the brother said, it, it, he, said uh, he said, they'll be all right, we've got to go, Paul. Then Leah said, well, uh, Sarah's not even asking the blessing, brother, I'm sure she knows that. He walked out. Now, you would think, that, I mean, to me, and you, you, you see that dream that, that he had, and, and brother, really, told me he was just so disturbed for days he had to tell his dad about it. And it was, it was such a dire dream because it was imminent. And then they drove up to the top of the mountain the, the, and then, then the, they saw this mountain cut out without hands coming toward the, right toward them and toward the, the valley. And, and uh, Brother Ram told him it's going to be like that one day. So it paints a picture of real urgency just like Brother Ram when he preached on the token. You know, it said those little kids were standing there and they heard the death cries in, 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 in the houses of the neighbors and, and they, they talked to their daddy's tunic and they said, Daddy, are you sure you buy the token? They said, yes, son. No, I'm sure I buy the token. You see? An imminence. An imminence. 
You know, what good does it do to have a message if we don't pay attention to it? It's just, it's just folly. It's, it's just water up with that's fast. But so for the very purpose that the eye for your understanding may be in light, that you might know what is the hope of his calling. And Jesus wants us to understand as well. Mark 7, 14, And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. <coughs> Hearken, pay attention, and understand. Matthew 15, 10, And he called the multitude, and he said unto them, Hear and understand. Now listen, before I show you how the God makes <laughs> he makes himself known to you, his great mystery secret of himself. I want to show you that unless you are ordained to know, you will. Well, you just will not in any way come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. There's just no way for it. And the scripture tells us that at the end time, men will be ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy 3 1 says, This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, un unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Never able. <coughs> They're trying, but they just can't do it. You know, Esau wept bitterly trying to seek repentance and he couldn't do it. Because repentance isn't weeping bitterly. Repentance is a change, a change of the heart. And we hear Jesus tell us, he tells those unbelieving Pharisees that the reason that they cannot come to the truth is because there's no room for the truth in their hearts. In John 8, 43, Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. And you know, it's not that they couldn't hear the words that Jesus was saying because when he would say a word that they, they contradicted it and they fussed with it and everything else. So it wasn't the words, it was the understanding. <laughs> you see, in John 8, 37, he says, I know that you're Abraham's seed, and you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I've seen with my father, and you do that which you've seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father, and Jesus saith unto him, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father, and they said unto him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. And Jesus said, If God be your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from, from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. They couldn't hear it. Not with this, but in here. You see? He says, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He's a murder from the beginning, and a boy not in truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaks of the lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces of me of sin. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's word. You therefore hear them not because you're not of God. I don't know a whole lot you know what you get into. He said, if you're, if you're Abraham's children, you do the works of Abraham. What if you're God's children? I just think you do the works of God. Huh? <clears throat> Paul says in Romans 1.31, Without understanding, they are covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. Notice, without understanding. Well, let's just read a few more here. Let's, let's just read a few verses to speak of the same theme. Mark 8 and verse 17, And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because you have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither understand? Have you, uh, have your, have you your heart yet Hardened. In other words, you say a hardened heart will cause you not to hear and not to understand. Now, this is what he's talking about. He said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And they said, Well, is he talking about bread? Is anybody hungry? He said, No, don't you understand? I'm talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. A little leaven leavens a whole lot. And he said, Are you still dull of understanding? You're not really listening to what I'm talking about? <clears throat> Ephesians 4 18 says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Acts 28 and 27 says, For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, 
and should be converted, and I should have to heal them. Again, John 12 and verse 40. He, uh, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. You see, God is the one that hardens the heart. He did to Pharaoh. He did to Egypt. He's doing it to this nation. I preached a message on it years ago called the Hardening Process. <clears throat> you can look at it. When God brought those ten plagues, he didn't bring them all at once, not one after another, boom, 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 like that. There's a period of time in between when they forgot about the plagues. They forgot it you know, because things were back to normal again. You know, like when 9-11 happened, I was overseas and a whole bunch of people had left church years ago, they all came back to church for one week. And they found out that this wasn't the end of the world. You know, they, they quit coming again. You see? But God brings the hardening. He hardens the heart. How does He do it? He brings a trial. You go to God during the trial. That's fine. He lets the trial go away. And then you get soft and, and you go away. You go out. You get cold again. Then he brings another trial. People, their, their heart warms up during the trial, right? Well, you know, if you take metal, and anybody's worked with metal knows this, if you heat treat it enough times, you can break a bar that's that wide. You can break it with your bare hands. It'll crumble. Hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Eventually, it's so brittle to break. And that's what God is doing in this nation. That's why, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, based on the time, you think that this is the last person we've ever had. <coughs> I don't know. God could give a, a period of, uh, of reprieve for the next four years. And then hit it with another hot, another cold, another hot, another cold. You know? We just don't know. All I know is that we want to think, when, when there's ten of us that are ready, there's going to be a rapture. And God's ready than us. He's got all the time in the world. I mean, time is something that deals with us. And, and a lot of us get older, we know what time is all about. The younger ones don't understand it. <coughs> In Luke 18, uh, 8 and verse 10, and he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but the others in parables, that seeing they might see, and hearing they might not understand. So, notice what we're talking about then. Here we've got a God who wants to be known, but there's some hindrances. The ones who wants to make known to one capable of, of knowing. So then God has to do something to you to change you so that you can be capable of knowing. And so Jesus said, now look, when I'm talking to you in parables, I'm talking to them as well. But see, you know the inside because we've gone over the doctrine, we've talked a lot, and you know the parable is just kind of a, a putting the, you know, a, a hammering the nail down. But to them, they don't know the inside. So what they're doing is they just see the parable, it's a story. We're like in this message, tell us the story, Brother Rabbit. There it is, we revert it back to story, 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 the story, that story, that. And isn't that sweet? The kids will tell me a bedtime story, Brother Rabbit. The story are fine, Brother Sister, but you know, the story without purpose is it just totally it'll take you in the wrong direction. You can take a story and you can make it go in whatever direction you want it to go. In. That's what parables do. <laughs> in Matthew 13 and in, in 13. Therefore I speak to them in parables because they seeing, they see not. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah which says, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see and not perceive. So there is, there is the majority of humanity are not ordained to see and understand. Now I'll make you be thankful for election and predestination. Because it's out of your hands and saying these things. <clears throat> Mark 4 and verse 12. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Also, Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And to whom shall he make to understand the doctrine? Well, that's the real question tonight, isn't it? Who? Who can see? Who can understand? First Timothy 1 7. Desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. And oh, brother, I get emails all the time from guys, that, well, brother, well, you know, maybe now that he's dead, uh, you know, now he'll understand. He was only talking to Brother Brown. Now he'll come to the right understanding. Hey, <laughs> well, brother, you know what? The scripture fits. Desire to be a teacher of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. 
brother telling me, well, there's hundreds and hundreds of scriptures that says that the bride is going to go through the judgment. I said, really? Send them to me. Come on, wait. Send them to me. Send me your hundreds of scriptures and hundreds of quotes that says the bride is going through the judgment. When a vindicated prophet of God said the bride will not go through the judgment, and Jesus Christ himself said the bride will not, he said, he, said, uh, he that believes on me um, will not go through the condemnation, which word condemnation is actually more judgment. <laughs> Brother and sister, we're not going to the judgment. We're judging ourselves now. So these people can sit around the message for years and years and years, contradict the vindicated prophet of God, say, well, you know, Brother Rackham said, you know, the, his rapture message was very vain, and, you know, just not very clear. Said, Listen, Brother, he explained it very clear. So there's a shout of voice in Trump. He didn't say anything about it's going to a, a, a judgment somewhere in between there. And the judgment, the white throne, is at the end of the millennium. Daniel 12 and 10. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Hosea 4 and 14. Therefore the people have, uh, uh, that doth not understand shall fall. And Micah 4 and 12. But they know not the thoughts of God, neither understand they his counsel. <laughs> so it's very apparent that there is a way which seems right to man, but the way thereof is the way of death. The man that choose a way that seems right. Now, as I said, God wants his own to understand his great deep secret mystery, but he keeps his secret from others, as the scripture tells us, lest they understand that God would have to bless them, as the scripture says, lest he'd have to heal them. So we see then, the fact number one, God wants to express himself to reveal himself. The fact number two, he's omniscient, omnipotent, invisible. And his thoughts are way out of our league and our ability to comprehend. And since God cannot change, and since our thoughts are not his thoughts, then he has to do something for us in order for him to be able to express himself in a way that we could possibly know and possibly understand. So in all three of those facts, we have to deal with, with we see first of all, God wishes to do something that is beyond the pale and scope of what he is intrinsically and essentially. So God must step outside the boundaries of his invisibility and outside the boundaries of his intrinsicality to bring to pass his purpose and intentions of being expressed. Because God cannot change. That's an immovable factor that had to be considered. He cannot lie. He cannot change. Malachi 3, 6, I am God, I change not. He was 13 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. <coughs> therefore, he must, uh, therefore, we must change in order to be able to understand it. And in order to do that, he must change the way in which we as mortal men can understand and comprehend his immortality. So first of all, he chose the avenue of his expression through his son Jesus Christ to express himself. That's what his sermon called, Christ is the mystery of God. That's been revealed. In other words, not Christ is the mystery himself. Because as we read in many scriptures last week, God is a mystery. But he is, the, God is the mysterious one, but God chose to reveal himself through, through this channel or by this means called Christ. Therefore this title could be read, God being a mystery revealed that mystery through Christ. Christ then is revealing uh, uh, is the revelation of the mystery of God. And that is the first of God's purpose and plan in expressing himself. It was through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, so Jesus had the mind of the Father. In fact, you know, Jesus never said one time, thus saith the Lord, you know what? He didn't. He didn't have to. God was in. God was in Christ. That's why Brother Ryan said sometimes the apostles heard him say this. Is that, who's talking? Because sometimes they heard Jesus, the man, other times they heard the Father. You see? Now, <clears throat> Jesus said in, in Luke 10, 22, No man knoweth who the Father is, but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal. So if no man knows the Father, then how could the Father himself express himself? He couldn't. Because you don't know if that's, uh, you know, one of those three million Hindu gods talking to you audibly or not. You see? In Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus said, Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal. And we saw where no man could even understand 
that revealing that God did not do something for him. In fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. And we see what Paul says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world do, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor have heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, being the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man that sin him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God knows. <coughs> So Paul is telling us something that's very important here, and that is this. There is no way that he could ever, we could ever begin to understand the things of God unless we have the Holy Spirit. It's the same as those who think by eating certain foods or not eating certain foods, they will be able to keep themselves clean from the diseases that the nations are breeding in their labs, and you can't do it. I'm sorry, no sir, no matter how good a food you eat, the air is polluted. And so is the water. So you're stuck with the toxic air in the water. And no matter if you if you do not spray your crops, the government's doing it for you when they crisscross the skies every morning, putting out those pollutants in those, uh, you know, what we call those contrails. <coughs> contrails. <coughs> so unless you are inoculated with the Holy Ghost, you will perish from the end-time plagues. 80% of the foods that are processed in this country are GMO. So if you're eating processed foods, you know, you're eating 80% of your diet is GMO. And France has fi finished a long-term study showing GMO foods produce tumors in mice. So you're being fed foods that will cause cancer. Brother Graham prophesied a lot worse is going to fall on this nation. He said, make things that look, you know, cancer look like a toothache. <coughs> I've heard men say, he won't do any good to pray over your food if you know when we eat that, which the prophet of God warned us about, because you're turning out a vindicated warning from God. Now listen. Now listen. These brothers know when we eat more hybrid corn and wheat than you can shake a stick at. Well, and what they say is contrary to what our vindicated prophet told us to do, because he said you better pray over it. He said that's all you can do is pray over it. Right. <coughs> So what we see is that although the warning was given by the Holy Ghost that these diseases and hybridization processes would be here in the last days and, and basically bring everything to ruin, yet it will be so wide scale that it will affect everything that you eat. And even the medicines you take, you know, you think, well, I'm only eating organic meat. Let me tell you something. There isn't anything such, there isn't anything that's organic today. Nothing. That's right. Because the chemtrails out there fall in the grass, the cows eat the grass, and they get those chemicals in their bodies, and the acid rain and everything else. You can't eat pure organic, but you can pray. And you better pray. <coughs> I've even heard ads describe all the symptoms that you'll get from the med medications that they sell. And the list is 10 to 20 times the symptoms that you wanted to get rid of. They sound like an auctioneer. They speak so fast that people can hardly hear what they're saying. And yet, I've seen the list of medications, what they'll produce in, in, in your arm. Like, well, like this product could cause you stomach ache, nausea, vomiting, internal bleeding, blindness, and death. But what are you taking it for? Hey, you. So you're going to exchange bleeding, internal bleeding, dying and death for a year. I'm sorry, but I'll cough a little bit. I won't take their stuff. <coughs> well, who in their right mind would take something that causes all of that just to get over a year? You know, the world is going insane. And Brother Brown said in a sermon, questions and answers, COD, paragraph 110. But here's where you get it, my brethren. I believe with all my heart that it's written in the scripture that no food should be received without it being received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. See? If you eat it, say, 
Lord Jesus, you prepared the food for me. Now with faith I sanctify this food to the strength of our bodies. Then eat it, for in all we do is by faith. I think I might even just memorize that. Now I want you to notice that he says we, we, we should eat. But just make sure that you pray over it. And if we are to avoid everything he mentions in these and many other quotes on the subject, you couldn't eat meat, eggs, fish, corn, wheat, other vegetables due to the fallout. Nor should we drink milk or even get drink water because the stuff's all polluted. And he said the earth food. In fact, in wisdom versus faith, he said the earth itself is a womb. <coughs> where, did God, where did God place the seeds? Where are seeds put? In the womb. God put seeds, and what does man do? Like devils in the womb? He'll make a child be formed if he can. That's what devils have done uh, on the earth, hybriding, making creatures that's not so. I better leave off on that. I'll, I'll never get to the rest of this here. I got wrote down. You know what I mean? That's the reason this deformed creation about, about to be cast. God's finished with it. The world's all out of order. Everything's wrong. The streams are polluted. The air is polluted. Filth and stink. So even the air we breathe is causing people to suffer with cancer and emphysema and all these other bronchial and respiratory conditions. <coughs> we can't stop breathing. You know, walk around with an oxygen tank. Now, getting back to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 12. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know <coughs> the things that are freely given to us of God. So the very purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit is to know. Well, I'm going to have a discussion with Brother Adam today. All these things are coming on the earth, and Brother Adam will call the Holy Spirit your inoculation. One place he said, I'm getting ready to go overseas, and he said, they want to inject me with all this yellow fever and all this other stuff. He said, I don't need it. He said, I got the Holy Ghost. He's my inoculation. <clears throat> There's no need to be taking these flu vaccines unless you want flu. I wouldn't take them. It's a live virus. You put a live virus in your body. And you've even done studies recently, last year, and they've proven that, the, that, the, that more people that get the inoculations are the ones that get the flu than they spread it. So notice it tells us that we receive the Holy Spirit of God in order to know. That's it. So unless you're born of the Spirit of God, there's no way for you to understand God or His Word. And yet men will argue and fuss over things that they don't even understand. They have no way of understanding because they're not going yet. <coughs> he says, verse 13, which things also we, know, we speak, not the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost <coughs> teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he, that, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So you see, in order for God to express himself, he had to overcome some obstacles, namely the fact that no man can know the things of God unless the Spirit of God is in him. That is why we have so many people in this message who are so messed up. Not only this message, but all of so-called Christianity today. They haven't been born again. They have been grafted into this message, but have not been born into it. <coughs> from the unchangeable God, Brother Ramson, I am God and I change not. He doesn't change. He can't change. And if that's what he gives those first expectants back there, that's what he gives the second expectants, that's what he gives the third and fourth, and everyone he calls uh, will be the same thing. He said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. And if a vine puts forth a branch and it brings up grapes, the next vine or the next branch that the vine puts forth will bear grapes. You can't make one bear pumpkins and other watermelons and then grapes. You can't do it, see? It shows it's been cast. It's, it, it's a vine that's been grafted, that's right. And some vine has been, or, or some bunch has been grafted into the vine. In fact, in the Church Age book, Brother Ransom from Patmos Vision, but if the vine ever brings forth another branch of itself, that branch will be exactly like the vine itself. It will be the same kind of a branch that was brought forth at Pentecost. It will speak in tongues, prophesy, and have the power and signs of the resurrected Jesus Christ in it. Why? Because... <coughs> It's thriving on the natural resources of the vine itself. You see, it wasn't grafted into the vine. It was born into the vine. When those other branches were grafted in, all they could do was bear, bear their own fruit that they, were, that they were not born of that vine. 
They don't know about the original life and, 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 and original fruit. They cannot know for they were not born of it. But if they had been born of it, that same life that was in the original stem, Jesus, would have come through them and manifested through them. John 14, 12. Very, very, I say, as you he that believe in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall I do, because I go unto my Father. Now listen. <coughs> People say, oh, get off that stuff. Now, I'm not going to get off it until the end time. Or until God tells me to get off it. Because if you're not ready, you know, people say, well, you know, I know that when the third, when, when, when the squeeze comes down, the third pole, we already know it, Brother Brown said to the bride, well, you said, well, let me tell you something. What is the third pole? It's speaking life. Right? Life in the fish, life in the hand rice kids, life in the squirrels. <laughs> Listen, that's no different than John 14, 12. Creating an eyeball or creating an eardrum. Right? Mm. Now listen, God is giving us plenty of opportunities to exercise what He's already placed in us by the new birth. And we sit back and say, I don't want to bother God. I had brothers right two weeks ago, they said, Brother, they said, we've got a terrible family here in, Mal in Malawi, Mozambique. One brother's got 180 <coughs> families in the churches he's established, another has 150. <laughs> one established eight churches, the other established twelve churches. People starving, they went to the visit the people and just, you know, the kids' bones showing through everything else, just starving. Their brother, you know, we're, we're, we're starving. We, we need food. I said, well, brother, I'll, I'll send you some money right away for food. But I said, I'm going to pray right now and I'm going to ask my father to send rain because that's what you need. And I said, you need to be bold enough to stand up before your congregation and say, we're going to pray for rain. And you need to pray with confidence. Amen. And you know what? They've been getting a lot of rain. A lot of rain. The whole situation changed. And God will give us plenty more opportunities, brother and sister, to exercise your God-given right as a son of God. Amen. Because the nature is there by the new birth. Now, those that don't have the new birth, they don't understand these things. I don't say that to be mockery. I just say because if you're grafted into this message, you'll never understand what it's all about. But Brother Graham said if you're born in this message, then the very fruits that were in Jesus' life are going to be in yours. Because it's the same Father. <clears throat> now the problem we have in this message is that people don't know the difference between revelation and delusion. But they are two different words and they mean two different things. Just like a period of coming, they're two different words and mean two different things. And if you're being deluded, but you call it revelation, then what have you got, my friends? And I get emails all the time from people that are so deluded they think that they know more than a vindicated prophet. And the word revelation means the act of revealing or disclosing something revealed, something not previously known or realized, but is made known or realized. In scripture it is a manifestation of divine will or truth. So we see that revelation is something that God did before, uh, or, or God beforehand hid, but then uncovers or discloses so as to reveal or make that truth known to men. That's what we're talking about tonight. <coughs> we're talking about the fact <coughs> that God hid it because he made man, period. And man wasn't him. And man was not able to understand his unfathomable ways. But he revealed it by giving you his, a portion of his spirit, a measure. And by having the Spirit, you could understand because the, the, the Spirit, the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. So if you've got the Spirit of God in you, you will search the deep things of God. You see? <laughs> now contrast that to delusion. For delusion comes from deception, the act of deceiving. And to deceive, you must take a truth and do something to hide it from man. So revelation takes that which is hidden and reveals it, while deception takes that which is true and does something to hide it from men. And the result is delusion. Like we've had this thing, uh, Benghazi. Hide it from the people, hide it from the people. Don't let them know. <clears throat> they knew four hours before. In fact, they knew days before. In fact, the, the, the consulate there knew, knew several days. They said for two weeks they were being scouted and everything else. They knew that there was going to be an attack. They asked for help. They said, hire some locals. So who do they hire? A bunch of Al-Qaeda. That's who they hired. Can you imagine hiring the fox to protect your chickens? Now, come on. They knew what was going on. Total cover-up, like, like the Watergate. That's delusion. 
You see? So revelation takes that which is hidden and reveals it, while deception takes that which is true and something and does something to hide it from men. And the result is delusion. So we can, we can say revelation reveals or manifests, while deception hinders or covers up truth. In other words, then a delusion is anti or the opposite of revelation. So we see the importance of revelation to the believer. Revelation is what seals us in. Revelation is what takes all the teaching by the fivefold ministry and anoints that mental faith with an ability to take on word upon word upon word and bring it into a supernatural dynamic revelation that seals us into Christ the Word and readies us for the adoption. <coughs> and, <coughs> and this ministry is not getting you ready for when the times are getting tougher and tougher and tougher, then there's something wrong with this ministry. And I, I've been preaching this for years and years, brother and sister. You can go back in seven, eight years ago, you're saying the same thing. You've got to get ready. You've got to look. Brother Bell used to talk to us about people praying food on the table during the Depression. Well, that's not Mark 16, brother and sister. Mark 16 is laying hands on the sick. Praying food on the table, what would you call that? I'd say it's the same thing when Jesus took fish here and multiplied it and made loaves and loaves and loaves. I say praying food on the table is no different from praying squirrels because that's food on the table. Right? It's not trying to be a prophet. It's just realizing we are sons of God and we're getting ready for a, for, for a, a great battle. A great battle. <clears throat> you just better be ready. You better have the tools. Of your, you know, what good is it to have a gun if you don't know how to shoot it? Go out and take lessons if you got a gun. Go out and take lessons on how to shoot it. Well, what's good your Bible if you don't know how to use it? Huh? What good what are the promises of God if you just keep them, keep them in the sheath, so to speak? Keep them in your pocket. You know, Brother Bosworth used to get very excited, Brother Bell said. Brother Bell knew him very well. He'd, he'd get like a little boy almost at Christmas time. He'd get real excited when he saw it. There were some deaf people. Because that was a special. <coughs> That was especially. Some people have faith for, for, for finance. Some people have faith for healing. Some people have faith for this, that, and the other. But when you know what you've got faith for, use it. And just keep using it until it spills over to other areas. First John 2 and 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy Ghost. You have it. And you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you do know it. And that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. That word hath means echo. Let, let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you in all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as, as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, <coughs> what, what good is this message doing us if we're not using it? Honestly. You know, what good if, if, if God would say, well, you know, William Brown, where do you want the squirrels? Oh, <clears throat> Lord, you know, I don't want to bother you. I mean, that's, you know, that's just a big thing, and, and I just don't want to bother you anymore. <clears throat> well, listen, that wasn't much of anything, because he could have gotten squirrels anywhere. He could have gone down to the co op and probably bought some squirrel. It wasn't that he was starving to death. But what about people starving to death? What about people in a real need? What about an economy that's collapsing, everything around us falling? What about what we saw on the East Coast? It was just a little bit of a warning to what's coming. People diving through dumpsters to get some food. And yet, listen, all the radio guys have been telling them for the last several years, you better get stuff in, the, in, in your closets. You better get your food stored up because it could be a tornado, it could be a disaster. Who knows what's going to be? And we have a vindicated prophet of God that told us it's going to be a whole lot worse than that. He said the economy is going to be such that 
uh, you know, that, that uh, you know, he make the first one look like a Sunday school picnic. He said uh, the cancer would be so bad, it make it look like a, uh, I mean, uh, there's coming diseases that'll make cancer look like a toothache. And so with all these things coming down, we've, we've had weird weather patterns, we've had tornadoes, we've had drought, we've had hurricanes, we've had all kinds of things happening, and yet people say, well, you know what, uh, I know, I know you warned us, that's okay, I'm going to just have faith in God, well that's fine, you have your faith in God, and everybody else is eating mashed potatoes, dehydrated, a little water, you can eat your faith. I'm going to tell you what, Noah stopped up the ark. He did. Now, I'm not saying being fanatic about it, but I'm just saying this. These things are coming, and there's going to be a lot of tests. And just don't be stupid. You know, people live on the East Coast, and they got three days worth of food in the refrigerator, and they think things are going to be normal. My neighbor across the street ran 10 Kroger's. He was a regional manager for 10 Kroger's, and he said, we only have enough stuff to feed a day, to, to stock a shelf for a day and a half. And he says, when these storms come up, we, the first thing that goes is water, milk, and butter, and bread. Just kind of the staples they go. Well, you ought to have enough. I had people leave the church years ago in 99. When I, I started wondering back then. I've got, listen, I've got, I've got articles on the internet that I wrote in 97. And everything that's in those articles is coming to pass right now. Not because I said them, but because of the indicated prophet of God did. And I put them all together with the scripture. The economy, you go, you go to the end time economic judgment, or the uh, depression judgment. You read that, and you'll see that those things are happening today. Also, all the, uh, the oncoming storm of judgment, it's all coming. Brother Brown warned us, 50 years ago he warned us. You think, you know, for 50 years, it's been in the message for 20 or 30. You think that, you know, you'd be well ahead of the picture. Be ready for these things. But no, people don't really believe what he said. They just don't, they, they really don't believe what he said. They don't believe that, uh, you know, somehow, I don't know, even, I, I think that there's people in this message don't even believe there's going to be a rapture. But they're hoping that it doesn't come in their lifetime because they want to enjoy life. I said, why would you want to enjoy this past house when... You know, I have not seen or hear heard or entered into the heart of man the wonderful things that God has in store for us. Why would you be content with this past house in a body that falls apart? Lord, just let me go home. You see? So I see the Holy Spirit is our teacher and the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon the believer. Is that is that what allows you to understand, to know and to understand the deeper things of God? In 1 Corinthians 2 and 1, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not in excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I delivered not, I, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And, and in my speech, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that is the problem that we have. Men have received their learning from men and not from God. Brother Ram talks in a sermon, the voice of the science said, the elected listens to the voice, but the unelected ignores it and says, nonsense, go on, we'll take the same old school. And that's the way they did in the days of Luther. So it comes, and it all comes down to what is our motive, what is our objective for believing this message. God said that he would bless those that hearken to the voice of the Lord, and, he would, and those that would not hearken to the voice of the Lord, he said he would curse. But God also promised curses and vexa vexation. And listen, if you go to Deuteronomy 28, just read it. Verse 1 through 15 is blessings. Verse 15 through about 45 is curses. And the curses are much, much more than the blessings. And yet there, uh, many of them are the same thing as the blessings, although they're turning into curses. But as I mentioned earlier, Paul said, if we are born from above, and if we have received the Holy Spirit, it is in order that we might know and understand the things of God. And John said in 1 John 2 and 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. So in closing, I want to review the three facts that we need to know concerning God's threefold promise of expressing Himself to mankind. Number one, God wants to be known. He wants to be known. He wants to do things for you more than you want Him to do things for yourself. Years ago, I had a brother. I said, brother, you know, you should ask God to help you know those things. Oh, brother, I don't want to. God's got so many things to do. 
I don't want to bother you. <laughs> Keep imagine saying that, you know, oh, my parents are busy. I don't, I don't really want to ask you to help me. What kind of a relationship is that? He wants to be expressed to you more than you want him to be expressed. The people said, oh, we can't take that, Moses. Cover your face. They couldn't take the Shekinah glory. Oh, I'd love to see it. Honestly, brother, I'd, I'd love to see it. Oh, no, let, let, let Moses speak. We don't want to hear from God anymore. I'd love to hear the thundering roar of God's voice. Yeah, I think you would too. But man, no. But John said, that's what we have the anointing for, is to know. So God wants to be known. He wants to express himself. In fact, he wants to be known to know to you more than you want him to be known to you. And that's a fact. But there are some other facts that complicate these issues. And Brother Brown said in paragraph 78, but what he wanted to do, he loved Father, but he was a father. And the only way that he could express it was to become a son of man. You know, I, I heard a study on the radio the other day. They said that one of the greatest moments in a 35-year-old man's life, when they reflect back on their life, you know, is the birth of a child. There's something about fatherhood that just changes your life. Well, God wanted to be a father. And He wants to have that relationship with you. More then you want to have that relationship with him. And, you know, you kind of see that in the natural. You parents, you want to have that relationship with your kids more than they want to have with you. But you know what? When they get a little bit older, they're going to want it too. That's right. He loved fatherhood, for he was a father. And the only way to express it was to become son of man. That's the reason Jesus kept saying son of man. See, they didn't know what he's talking about, many of them. But now you get it. He wanted to express himself. That was his, one of his great threefold purposes was to express himself, to identify himself with human beings, to reveal himself in Christ. So the first fact that we have to deal with is that God wants to be known. He wants to express himself. And that is fact number one. But there's also these facts that complicated that. As we said, fact number two was God's invisible. Therefore, in his invisible, in, 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 in immortal form, He's way too infinite, way too complicated and mysterious in that form to be comprehended by mortal men. And three, God is too great to be comprehended by the human mind. As Isaiah 55 and 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my thoughts are way above your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts are from the earth. So what we see tonight then is that God being unchangeable could not change himself in any way that would become visible to us so that he changed us by giving us part of his spirit. To be able to see him in his essentiality, in his intrinsicality, by giving us new birth. And we found that it is the new birth that opens to us the windows of heaven and gives us understanding. And as John calls it, we have received that anointing that we might know all things. I don't think we really understand the importance of of the baptism of the Holy Ghost in your life. Not like we should. Without it, you haven't a clue. You might be religious, but you haven't a clue. Without it, you don't have that personal, intimate relationship with your Father. <coughs> Without it, you don't have inoculation from the things coming on this earth. Without it, you don't have a hope of going in a rapture. You see? Without it, you don't have a hope of speaking things into existence. You don't have a hope of, of John 14, 12 in your life. You don't have a hope of any of these things. So if there's one thing that I just would request of all of you is to examine your soul to make sure that you have that spark of God, that dynamics. Because you can have the mechanics all day and all and that car ain't going to run. you got to have the dynamics, brother and sister. As Father has prayer. Gracious Father, we thank the Lord because you have given us your dynamics. <clears throat> you have come down to give it. And where could we get it from a greater source than your very presence? So, Father, we ask for each and every one in here, Father, who has a desire to be anointed from the Holy One. We pray that that holy anointing would come into their life 
and anoint them, Father, from the top of their head to the bottom of their foot. And may their life express holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. For we ask it humbly in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. But change your service now to communion. That the brothers will go bring the elements up. Amen. If you open your Bibles to John chapter 13, we we'll take a text while the brothers will bring forth the elements. supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I washest thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, Not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed, (coughs) he is not saved to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he for he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken their garments, And was set down again, he said unto them, Knoweth ye what I have, I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, he may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whosoever I send, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was... Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I have given a thought, which I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought 
because Judas had the bag that Jesus had sent unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received that sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone, gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straighten, straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while, I am with you. If ye shall seek me, and as I seek unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Amen. Let's bow our heads as the brothers who pray over the elders. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you, Lord, for being able to come here to the elders and to serve us, Lord. Lord, we just ask you that you bless and sanctify this bread. It represents your broken son's body. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross for our sins. And Lord, we you know we don't feel worthy sometimes, God, but we thank you for that sacrifice that makes us worthy, God. And Lord, we just ask you humbly, Lord, if there's anything between us that we need forgiven, Lord, we just ask you to forgive. Thanksgiving to you, Father, for that grace that was given us and now <coughs> have union with you, Father. And we give you glory to Jesus Christ. Amen.